Plastics and electronics are essential to our modern day lives. Without plastic and electronics, there will be no laptops, no air cons, no automobiles. Our food and drinks will be spoiled because of no plastic packaging to protect them from air. And by 2050, the Earth will have 2 billion more consumers and mouths to feed. And as our living standard rise, so will our consumption and demand for goods. The global economy is now based on the take, make, throw, linear approach. Take the raw materials, make them into useful products, and throw away after using. And at this rate, there may be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. An estimated of 5 trillion pieces of plastic waste litters all our major ocean basins. A report from the United Nations in 2019 estimated that the world generates around 50 million tons of electronic and electrical waste every year, and only 20% is formally collected and recycled. Clearly, there is a need to switch from a linear to a circular economy. And for businesses, this is an opportunity for innovation and value creation. Hello and welcome to Circular Economy Financing, the third episode in our Sustainable Financing Awareness Series. The Singapore Business Federation is pleased to be working together with UOB as our knowledge partner on a series of webinars revolving around different topics of sustainable financing every month. And whether you're a large MNC or small SME, whether you're an engineer or building developer, whether you're in the energy, packaging, electronics or recycling industry, we hope to increase your awareness and understanding of sustainable financing for circular economy projects today. Our objective is for you to live this webinar thinking in terms of how to partake in the waste management and circular economy opportunities in Singapore and beyond. My name is Shu Lin from SBF, and I'm pleased to be your host and moderator for today's virtual event. And ladies and gentlemen, we have an exciting lineup of speakers for you today. Over the next one hour, we'll be hearing from four esteemed speakers representing a broad spectrum of the industry. First from our regulators at the NEA, who will be setting the scene by sharing Singapore's plan on the circular economy. Second, from Elba Singapore. Elba Group is one of the world's leading recycling specialists based in Germany. And third and fourth, from UOB, our knowledge partner, who will cover plastic and e-waste recycling trends and opportunities respectively. In between the four presentations, We'll be conducting three polling sessions with you, our dear audience, watching this from home. And at about four o'clock, we will start the Q&A session. You can start typing in your questions using the Q&A function now. Uh, in fact, during the entire webinar, and the questions will be seen by our panelists. If you're a Singapore company looking at recycling opportunities or circular economy projects overseas, or if you have any questions regarding sustainable financing, please sign up for our free business consultation session. Just email my colleague Zichuan and SBF and UOB will be happy to meet with you after this webinar to assist you. To kick off this event, I'd like to invite Mr. Christopher Tan, Director of Sustainability Division from NEA to tell us more about Singapore's Zero Waste Master Plan closing the resource loops in Singapore, and relevant industry schemes that our members and SMEs present here today can tap into. Christopher is responsible for strategies and programs in sustainable ways to resource management and energy efficiency. Previously, he was involved in public health operations in vector control and public cleanliness and policy making for air quality and waste management. Christopher was also formerly an economist at the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Christopher, please. Hi, thanks very much, Shu. Okay, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks very much to SBF uh, for the opportunity to share on this today for you. So my presentation today will be about Singapore's efforts towards a circular economy and the Zero Waste Master Plan, which uh, anchors this effort. Okay. 
So uh, first, I just want to outline the vision on what the Zero Waste Master Plan is. It's, uh, it is a vision for sustainable, resource efficient, and climate resilient Singapore. Uh, the three resiliences that we hope to build are climate resilience to address climate change, coping with rising temperatures and changing rain rainfall patterns, resource resilience to ensure a safe and secure supply of critical resources to keep our economy going, to keep our local supply, and also to overcome global resource constraints by maximizing resource efficiency, closing our resource loops. And finally, economic resilience, ensuring that our future Singapore economy remains competitive by overcoming carbon and resource constraints, and rallying stakeholders towards sustainable economic growth. Uh, so the Zero Waste Nation, um, here we have, a, uh, this was released in 2019 and in the Zero Waste Master Plan, it was a vision set out um, with, to lay out the following strategies for with important roles by the government, businesses, and the community in working towards a vision of towards zero waste. Some of the targets under the Zero Waste uh, Nation and Zero Waste Master Plan are to extend Samarkal's landfill's lifespan beyond 2035. It is our only landfill and the place where waste receives its final resting place. So we want to reduce the amount of waste sent to landfill per capita per day by 20% by 2026, 30% by 2030. And by 2030, achieve an overall 70% recycling rate. So the Zero Waste Master Plan is also a key part of the SG Green Plan, which was recently announced with a vision of uh, trying to move towards Singapore, towards a greener and more sustainable nation. So what is the Zero Waste Master Plan about? At its core, it is about moving away from the linear economy, uh, moving away from um, take make waste uh, in our production consumption, um, which is eventually turned into waste and resource management by incinerating, incineration and by landfill. So this is a very traditional approach in resource management, but it's unsustainable because it leads to depletion of natural capital. So we are instead trying to move towards a circular economy approach uh, where we want to close our resource loops, use our resources for as long as possible and similar to many countries, we have framed our circular economy thinking along the lines of uh, sustainable production, sustainable consumption, and sustainable waste and resource management. Um, and actually, I think we will find that the circular economy principles apply in many aspects, which I will then touch on in the next few slides. So first on sustainable produ uh, production, which is about better design. Uh, so you see, this starts at a product level where companies can adopt more sustainable designs. So Greenpack and SME in Singapore uh, improved the packaging for their clients' products. This saved about 53 tons of material, about $6,000 per year. This was by moving to a polypropylene, from a properly polypropylene molded case, which was packaging for a product called a fuel replacement unit to lighter packaging, a paper carton box with polyethylene and foam. So it used less material it, um, compared to the polypropylene, used lighter packaging um, in the form of paper and polyethylene. Another example is Jurong Island, where wastewater is recovered and recycled for industrial use. Another example of um, elaborating on the previous slides is that of sustainable consumption. So this is something that each and every one of us can, can contribute to, to through simple actions in our lives. Zero Waste SG and NGO in Singapore, for example, has to bring your own campaign where consumer, it encourages uh, retail outlets to give consumers uh, sort of discounts for bringing their own containers. NEA also has a regular food waste reduction campaign, a CS Waste Less campaign, and the WWF Singapore also has a pl his Plastics Action Initiative where it gets companies to pledge uh, to reduce plastic waste. Reuse and sharing, oops, sorry. Reuse and sharing is another example. There are many avenues where people can participate. So to encourage the, the repair trade, NEA allocates stores and hawker centers. There are also um, outfits such as Repair Kopitiam, Resource Center, Residence Committee, where there are repair and sharing um, of items for residents to use so that we waste less and buy less overall. Okay, so uh, finally, sustainable waste and resource management. This is the end of the value chain where we really want to view our waste as a resource 
to try to extract as much treasure from it as possible. So one example here is metals, right? In Singapore, we recycle some 99% of our metals. There actually is this metal recovery facility operated by a company, Remax. So what it does is that you can, it recovers metals from incineration ash. So even after our products have been incinerated, metals actually don't turn into ash, but they can be recovered. So similarly, as you can see on the right, we recycle about 99% of our construction and demolition waste, turning them to new products, such as recycled concrete aggregate. So we want to do more to close the waste loops um, for more of our types of uh, waste in Singapore. I'll then next touch on this. So uh, first, to close the resource loops, um, there are three key, key resource loops which we are looking at. One is the resource Okay, so this Resource Sustainability Act was enacted in September 2019, giving legislative effect to new measures. The priority waste streams, which we are focusing on for now, are food waste, packaging waste, including plastics and e-waste. I'll touch on these in the next few slides. So one is for e-waste. Um, many of you might be aware of the uh, e-waste Extended Producer Responsibility Scheme, which was recently launched. I think uh, Alba will be touching on this later, so I will not speak too much on this, save that there are five uh, categories of products and that um, the producer responsibility scheme, which is licensed to Alba, works with producers and retailers in order to implement uh, this scheme to close the e-waste loop. And so I think many of you might have seen uh, these containers set up in, in supermarkets, at stores like Best Denki, Harvey Norman. Uh, so these are all in-store collection points uh, for e-waste and I would encourage everyone to start using them and deposit the, the right and deposit e-waste into them. Another area we're working on instead of closing the packaging loop and this includes plastics right so uh, for plastics here um, we are implementing a system for make it, uh, which will eventually lead to extended producer responsibility for packaging waste management. So um, this started Actually, this year, where there's mandatory, mandatory reporting of packaging data and plans to reduce, reuse, recycle packaging. This applies to producers with annual turnover of more than 10 million. Producers meaning those who make in Singapore as well as those who import. So the next few steps for these are already being, uh, are already being um, developed. Next year, we intend to put in place a legislative framework for beverage containers return scheme. This is the first place of EPR for packaging waste management. <laughs> And a full EPR scheme uh, is sort of our EPR phase two for more types of packaging waste. We plan to implement that by 2025. The last one I want to touch on is that of food waste, right? So there is a lot of potential for food to be val uh, valorized and converted into useful products, such as uh, compost, biogas. And uh, increasingly, I think we are seeing more and more research on food to food, where waste food from some streams such as barley, spent grains, and okara is then being converted into, into uh, nutritious, into more nutrition food, more nutrition and more food. So here we have a food resource valorization awards to encourage companies. Um, and that one, the, the award window for this year has closed uh, and the awards will be given out later this year. Uh, upcoming regulations uh, under the Resource Sustainability Act would be mandatory food waste segregation and treatment. So from 2021, developers of new large commercial and industrial premises will have to allocate space for on-site food treatment in their design plans. And from 2024, we are looking to mandate food waste segregation um, by large industrial and commercial food waste generators to ensure that segregated food waste is treated on, on site or off-site. Uh, so I just would like to invite all the companies here to join us on the journey towards zero waste. Here are a couple of schemes that I'd like to invite everyone to consider. And there are QR codes on these next few slides, which you can look at to try to find out more. So first there's a 3R fund. This is a co-funding scheme to encourage organizations to reduce waste disposed of um, by implementing waste minimization and recycling projects. The 3R fund co-funds up to 80% of qualifying costs, a cap of 1 million per project or applicant. And the areas that are funded are listed here. So we calculate the grand quantum by looking at the actual tonnage reused, reduced, reused, or recycled. And the amount of funding depends on the waste stream. Uh, some projects given higher priority are the new or innovative processes. 
uh, and also um, projects that target the waste streams that I've just listed, which are, which are more priority waste streams. The project duration um, is here. Uh, the maximum project duration is 3.5 years with the min and the minimum duration of operation is one year after 0 0.5 years of preparation. The minimum tonnage must be 100 tons over project duration and tonnage must be additional. So, you know, we, we from the government perspective, we, um, we would prefer not to fund projects which are already taking place. So, uh, because we want to start diverting more waste from landfill, not to sort of fund existing projects. Another initiative is the Packaging Partnership Program. This is a partnership between NEA and the Singapore Manufacturing Federation, which supports companies towards um, having more sustainable packaging waste management practices. Uh, so on this platform, there's sharing of knowledge and best practices. And in particular, we want to help familiarize companies with the NPR requirements, which I mentioned earlier, as well as future EPR requirements. So uh, I would encourage everyone here to take a look at the link. Um, in, if you are dealing with uh, packaging in this, in the, then packaging in any form or another. And in fact, many manufacturing processes use packaging, be it for, um, because something needs to be surrounding a product. So what are the benefits? Uh, potentially up to double the funding for NEA's 3R fund. Some information, you will also get info related to sustainable packaging waste management uh, and access to workshops and training, priority registration for that. Also, you'll get to use this logo for products with reduced packaging, which you can then use on your products to and try to emphasize to customers that they use less packaging. Also, you'll be listed on the PPP website and have the opportunity to have networks, to have uh, networking opportunities. Okay, that brings me to the end of the presentation. I just would like to encourage uh, everyone here um, to be part of the journey towards zero waste. And I thank SPF once again for organizing this seminar. I look forward to the upcoming presentations by the other speakers from ELBA as well as UOB. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Indeed, our members and SMEs can consider tapping into the 3R Fund and the PPP to reduce waste disposal and realize Singapore's vision towards a zero waste nation. An audience watching this webinar feel free to type in your questions to the panelists uh, to address them at any point of time. Before we move on to our second speaker, we would like to get your thoughts, our dear audience, working from home in our first polling session. Think about the different pillars of sustainability related to the environment. In which area are you most keen to pursue? May I have the poll questions launched, please? You will now see a poll question on your screen. Choose one answer and click on submit. May I have the results from the poll, please? So most people, 42% uh, are interested in circular economy, which is uh, precisely why you have joined our webinar, followed by renewable energy, um, energy efficiency and green building. And thank you very much for your participation. And you know this give, gives us a very good sense of where the interest lies from the audience and allow us to come back with, uh, with more relevant webinars to suit your area of interest. So moving on, we are privileged today to have Mr. Jakob Graf Lemstorff, CEO of Elba Singapore with us today. Jakob is responsible for two Elba entities here in Singapore. First, the Elba W&H Smart City, which is a joint venture between Elba Group and Singapore company Wa and Hua, and is also the JV appointed by NEA for waste collection in Jurong region. And secondly, the Elba e-waste smart recycling, which which Jakob can share more later and uh, what Christopher has mentioned just now. Jakob is also a member of the Advisory Council of the Plastic Recycling Association of Singapore and Vice Chairman of the Sustainability Committee uh, at the Singapore German Chamber of Commerce. Jakob will tell us more about what his company, Elba Singapore, is doing to close the loop on e-waste and plastic recycling and give 
practical tips to companies on waste management. So now I call upon Jakob to share with us his presentation. Jakob, please. Thank you, Shu, and thank you to SBF and also to UB for having me here today uh, and allowing me to introduce Alba and, and present to you all today. Before I start off with uh, introducing what we do and, uh, and my presentation, I also want to um, yeah, state my support um, and uh, for everything that NEA is doing. Uh, I first came to Singapore in 2017 uh, and have to say that in the last uh, four years, what I have seen in terms of development um, of circular economy projects, of legislation, um, of becoming more sustainable, um, that that is extremely impressive. And from, from everything I can tell, uh, a development that exceeds everything that happened in the decades before. Um, so we are very much happy to, to be in Singapore and, and hopefully to contribute to that journey um, of making Singapore a zero waste nation and closing the loop. Very briefly, I'll give an introduction of Alba Group. Um, then in more detail what it is that we actually do in Singapore uh, and briefly in Hong Kong, then on some of our sustainability initiatives and finally on the aforementioned Plastics Recycling Association of Singapore. Alba Group, uh, founded in Berlin, Germany over 50 years ago, um, is still family owned uh, and uh, now run by the two brothers, the sons of the founder. We are globally one of the largest waste management companies with 8,800 staff. Um, roughly 2 billion euros turnover and deal in anything um, solid waste related. Um, so we don't deal in, in air quality uh, as much and, and water, um, but anything in solid waste. As you see here, our portfolio spans from waste management activities, plastics recycling, electronic waste recycling, steel and metals recycling and trading, hazardous waste um, recycling, facility management services, trading, and so on. Um, but also in recent years, a lot more on um, not just the recycling activity and the physical recycling, but also on managing recycling systems, on what you see here, reusable pooling system. So in Germany, we, for example, work with large retailers um, and significantly reduce their packaging waste by using such reusable systems, um, take back systems, and so on. Um, so we're constantly trying to innovate, digitalize, and expand our portfolio in all areas solid waste. In Asia specifically, we focus on four verticals, hazardous waste, bio waste, plastics recycling, and what we call smart city solutions, which are collection projects, um, but always digitalized, working with new concepts, um, app-based, for example, digitalized routing, all these kind of innovations um, to further improve efficiencies uh, in, in the waste management and collection business. Now, uh, what, what we have been talking about all this time, uh, achieving a circular economy, that's at the absolute heart of our operations. Um, we first started recycling activities 50 years ago, when in Germany, waste was not even incinerated yet, it was most often going to landfill. Um, and our founder thought, why is this happening? There's, there are so many valuable resources in this. We should be looking to reuse them, to sort them, to separate them and reuse them. And that has been our motto for the past 50 years. Um, as we see here, uh, this is data of 2019, uh, where we have through our activities saved a total of 4.2 million tons of greenhouse gases. Uh, through metals, uh, recycling, uh, electronic waste, plastics, wood, paper, cardboard, and glass. So this is something that we are very proud of, and, and that's something that we really strive to improve year over year um, to, to make a bigger impact um, on sustainability and, and, and on the communities that we serve. Now, more specifically, what, it is, what is it that we do in Singapore? What is it that we do in, uh, in Hong Kong in a bit? Um, here we run two projects, uh, both appointed by NEA. One as public waste collector in the Jurong sector, which as Christopher also mentioned uh, just now, is at the moment still a very linear approach. Uh, our main job is logistics. 
we are collecting municipal waste and recyclables and bringing it to, to the incineration plant um, for, uh, for burning. And then as we heard, it goes to Remex uh, for metals extraction and then to Semakau landfill. However, as I said, that's not in our DNA and we want to improve upon that uh, and want to make it more circular. So we are always looking for ways. Um, what can we extract from waste? How can we at source segregate uh, for certain materials? and have now started with several pilots that, that I will mention a bit later. On top of that, uh, we always want to be sustainable within our own operations as well. Uh, so not just with the material we handle, um, but in our day to day. Uh, so our trucks are, for example, equipped with solar panels um, where we harness solar energy um, and can in turn save on diesel consumption and save on CO2 emissions. Uh, likewise, our trucks are equipped with air filters um, which filter out PM 2.5 and PM 10 particles. So all this, all these kind of activities um, have to do with us trying to become um, as sustainable as possible. Um, and in the future, of course, with, with also uh, something that the government is pushing um, with, for example, electric trucks becoming completely carbon neutral. So that's something that, uh, that, that's very important to us and, and that we strive to do. The second project being the aforementioned e-waste PRS uh, operations, which I'll get into a bit later. This is the, uh, the Jerome project. You see at the bottom right, again, we don't see ourselves simply as a collector. We really want to see how we can improve. What kind of data can we collect? All our trucks are also equipped with weight scales uh, where we on a daily basis can weigh and track how much waste was generated at every single um, HDB building, um, commercial premise, um, and so on, uh, to then see uh -huh, where can we improve uh, recycling rates, um, where can we get more out of the, our waste, which in essence still contains a lot of resources. We're, for example, now also looking at cameras in the, in the hopper of our truck to really see uh, how much valuable material is even still in the waste. Um, analyzing this through through an AI mechanism. So there are a lot of things that we can do to improve on the current system. Uh, and we are now just getting started, uh, having only entered Singapore one and a half years ago with our operations. Uh, at the top right, you, for example, see our, uh, our route planning. Uh, so now you see this is actually one day's route from, I think, six months ago. So we have all this data we are tracking from every single day of our operations where have our trucks gone? What have they collected? What's the efficiency of collection um, and, and so on. Now we get to the e-waste PRS. Um, as stated, we were appointed by NEA as e-waste PRS operator. This is the, uh, this certainly goes a step further uh, and is very much a circular system. Uh, and, and we are looking to build and improve upon this system daily, having just started three weeks ago. It's really our job to bring together all the different stakeholders. Producers, as the system uh, states in, in, in the name, Extended Producer Responsibility, are funding the scheme. We are responsible for managing the whole material flow as well as the money flow. Um, in essence, that means producers pay us a fee. We are responsible for collecting everything, pre-sorting and categorizing and weighing all the material then sending it out to recyclers for them to further process it. We are not a recycler ourselves. We are only managing the scheme, so to say. So as you see here, uh, this chart shows the uh, material flow. The first step is of course, that producers sell to consumers, uh, the different types of uh, e-waste, um, large household appliances, ICT, uh, so laptops, desktop monitors, printers, uh, screens, um, large household appliances or washing machines, refrigerators, air cons, um, uh, dryers, and televisions. And then we finally have PMDs, batteries, and bulbs. So these are all the uh, categories that fall under the scheme. It's then our job to build up the different collection schemes. So as mentioned, many of you will have likely already seen uh, electronic waste recycling bins across retailers, across community centers, and so on. Uh, we collect those. We will also organize e-drives on weekends um, in every town council, uh, several in every town council. These will take place on 
Saturdays once every quarter, so four per year for each location, 220 locations across Singapore. We are working with retailers for take back. We are working with um, facility management companies, condos, town councils, and so on. So it's really our job to bring everybody together and make sure that the maximum amount of e-waste is properly collected so that we can send it uh, for proper um, recycling. We then first bring everything to what we call our PRS logistics and sorting hub, where we record and weigh everything, um, pre-sort it into all the different categories, and then allocate it to the individual recyclers within Singapore, meaning we want to create a circular economy within Singapore without having to export any material, which is why it's also our job to work with recyclers, to audit recyclers, to also consult recyclers um, and tell them where they can improve in their processes, where it makes sense to possibly invest um, because there is not enough capacity within Singapore. Um, so that's, that's really in essence our job. And then recyclers uh, process everything uh, in terms of hazardous material uh, and raw materials are then brought back into the production uh, life cycle. So this is really a fully circular concept. In Hong Kong, we do the same, um, with the exception that we actually also run the treatment facility, um, where we process over 30,000 tons of electronic waste per year. Other than that, the process is quite similar. We do collection, we bring it in this case to our own facility and treat it. The difference being that Singapore already had quite a vibrant electronic recycling landscape. Um, so here it certainly makes sense to build up that infrastructure, whereas Hong Kong did not have anything in place. So we were in fact commissioned by the government to build our own plant um, and operate this for the next 10 years. Now a bit more specific, what are we doing in terms of sustainability and what can also companies do to improve their sustainability? So as stated, public waste collection at the moment is still quite linear. We um, have introduced a program that we call Alba Step Up App, uh, which incentivizes residents to recycle. Uh, we have equipped uh, small QR codes on, for example, all recycling bins in the Jurong sector, all publicly accessible recycling bins, uh, which are several thousand bins, on reverse vending machines, which we have rolled out on a trial basis in Jurong as well, in light of the upcoming deposit return scheme for beverage containers, uh, which is scheduled to go live in 2023 or 2024 in Singapore, and will again bring a circular approach for recycling of PT containers, metal cans, potentially glass bottles, Tetra Pak, and so on. On our e-waste bins as well, we are also working with BT Sports and Dow Chemical on a shoe recycling program, uh, where we have, I believe, 100 shoe recycling bins all across Singapore. So all these programs um, should facilitate at source segregation because we really want to improve um, getting all these resources out of the waste before it is sent to incineration because there is value in all this material. Um, and for this, we incentivize people to download our app, scan the code, recycle, and, and you will then be redeemed with what we call CO2 points because these points should in effect show what was your CO2 saving by the, react, by the recycling action um, that you just carried out. And then, of course, to incentivize, um, we offer certain rewards for these CO2 points. So these CO2 points can then be transferred to, for example, grab points uh, or discounts with Ohm Energy or Stoyo or some of our other um, sustainability partners. Now, more specifically, how can we help? Uh, what can companies do? Of course, we offer general waste collection and recycling services, but as I said, we don't want to focus just on the waste collection. We really want to improve upon that. So we also offer waste audits. This could be interesting for manufacturing sites, for big logistics warehouse hubs that create a lot of packaging waste or that create a lot of waste in their processing where we can come in, audit this and see what is actually being sent to incineration, what can be reused, how can you improve your recycling and how can you also save money by doing so? Because a lot of these resources actually have value. So that's something that we offer. We can come in and, and do waste audits. Uh, we can offer segregated e-waste collection services uh, on top of the general waste and recycling services. Of course, also segregation of cartonage, plastics, and whatever else there is. Um, we um, do corporate education and awareness campaigns. Um, on the one hand, um, to public institutions such as schools, um, 
uh, but also with, uh, with corporate clients. And finally, for the StepUp app, we are always looking for corporate partners either to equip, let's say, an office or so with QR codes for scanning or for your employees to gain rewards or um, for corporate partners on the back end for rewards. Then very briefly, uh, something I would very much like to highlight is that there are still a lot of opportunities available um, in Singapore um, for new players to come into the e-waste market because the capacity that we are uh, collecting now is still minimal and it will grow over time. Um, we are talking about huge volumes uh, when we say all of Singapore large appliances, refrigerators, air cons, um, TVs, and so on. So if there is anybody that's interested to move into recycling or to expand their capacity, please contact us. Uh, and certainly um, we can discuss and, and help you in, in setting up e-waste operations in Singapore. Then finally, I want to finish off with this. The Plastics Recycling Association of Singapore, uh, which was just very recently founded um, and is already gaining traction. I think we, we have very good support and, and I would like to thank NEA, MSE, um, ESG and, and, uh, and all the government organizations for supporting us in this. Um, our goal is to make Singapore a plastics recycling hub uh, for all of Asia, uh, for bringing in foreign technology, foreign know-how, um, creating a center of excellence within Singapore. For that, for example, um, Professor uh, Siram Ravakrishnan from NUS is supporting us um, and then exporting that to ASEAN. So we believe that that's a big chance for Singapore to become um, a recycling and sustainability hub within Asia. Um, if anybody is interested in joining such an initiative and in joining this association, please contact me. Um, we are always looking for new members and we believe that this can be highly successful and we believe that Singapore can and will be um, at the forefront of sustainability within the next 10 years with all the initiatives that we are seeing um, being planned uh, now by MSE and uh, NEA. So please do contact me um, in case you are interested in this. I'm happy to give you uh, further information about the um, Plastics Recycling Association of Singapore. That's it uh, from my side. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, of course, please contact me afterwards. Happy to engage and, and answer all your questions. And again, uh, thank you for SBF, uh, to SBF for giving me this uh, chance to speak today. Thank you, Jakob. And indeed, we can look forward to Elba reinventing the waste collection sector in Singapore through the use of innovation, data, and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, do download the Step Up app that was uh, highlighted by Jakob just now. And I think we definitely look forward to seeing the Elba trucks uh, in the Jurong area with your solar panels and air filters. So before we move on, we would like to get your thoughts, our dear audience, once again, watching this from your home in our second polling session. Think about sustainable financing and how it relates to your business. Are you interested in taking up sustainable financing? And why are you not tapping into it now? May I have the poll questions launched, please? So you will see on the screen two questions. Answer all questions and click on submit. And once, I, once again, I encourage um, ladies and gentlemen watching this from your home to just, uh, if you have any questions that you would like the panelists to address uh, at the Q&A session later, please feel free to key them in uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom now. May I have the results from the poll, please? Okay, so for the first question, would you consider taking on sustainable financing for your projects? We have 49% um, with uh, saying yes, and 33% who are undecided. So I think we hope that, you know, after attending our series of uh, sustainable financing webinar, that would help uh, you in 
perhaps moving to considering yes. And for the second question, what would be your main reason if you decide not to adopt sustainable financing? And I think, you know, one in two people said that they're not sure how to go about doing so. And um, really, you know, we are happy that you are here with us in this webinar, where our next two speakers from UOB will show us, you know, and perhaps dispel some of the myths of sustainable financing and tell us how we can start to embark on this journey. Our next speaker is Mr. Joseph Po, Head of Oil, Gas and Chemicals Sector Solutions Group, UOB. Joseph oversees business development, new solution rollout and risk management. And before this, he was responsible for the relationship management for SOEs, national oil companies and large corporates outside of Singapore. Joseph will tell us more about trends and opportunities for plastic recycling in the circular economy. Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shu, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for joining the session today. And also, thank you to SBF again for inviting me to this session. I hope everyone is keeping well and safe. My name is Joseph and I head the oil, gas and chemicals sector in UOB. So today I'll be sharing on the trends and opportunities for plastics recycling in the circular economy. I'll highlight the increasing public awareness to plastics pollution and reactions from various quarters. Next, I'll define what is meant by a circular economy. I'll also provide some color on the current recycling trends and market updates. Finally, I'll share UOB's financing solutions for the plastics recycling ecosystem. So we'll start by looking at the extent of plastics pollution globally. On an annual basis, about 8 million tons of plastics find their ways, in, their ways into the ocean. Asia contributes 80% of global ocean plastics waste, and 8 of the 10 ocean plastics polluting countries are in Asia. If we come closer to home, the amount of plastics waste disposed by ASEAN is more than 31 million tons annually, with, and the recycling rate is less than 12%. From Singapore's perspective, we generated about 868,000 tons of plastics waste in 2020, and our recycling rate is about 4% now. Plastics pollution, as all may be aware by now, harms marine and wildlife, and when it makes its way back into human food source, can also affect our health. So consumer awareness and sentiments are also changing. In a recent study by Sea Circular in 2020, 91% of the respondents from ASEAN expressed that they're extremely concerned about issues of plastics waste, and 84% are personally trying to take action. These results in ASEAN are consistent with a recent BCG study, where the respondents are intending to increase their plastics recycling activities and reduce their plastics footprint. On the government front, 71% of the respondents believe that their government are acting on the issue proactively through policies and regulation, but only about 45% think businesses are doing enough in the same area. So this is a potential opportunity for businesses to act on plastics waste and sustainability. A recent McKinsey study on a similar topic also showed that consumers in Asia are most willing to pay more for sustainable packaging. Globally, many of the top FMCG companies have already begun to act. So both PepsiCo and Unilever have committed to have 25% recycled content in their plastics packaging by 2025. Nike has reported that 75% of their products contain recycled materials. Adidas in 2019 estimates that it manufactured 11 million pairs of shoes from recycled ocean plastics. This is done mainly through their partnership with Pali, an organization focused on ocean plastics pollution. So what is the circular economy as compared to a linear economy? According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the circular economy is regenerative and restorative by design and is based on three principles. Firstly, use of circular design to reduce and remove waste and pollution. Secondly, keeping materials in continued use. And third, to regenerate the natural systems. Let me play a short video on the circular plastics economy.
If you'd like to download some of our insights on plastics recycling and sustainability, there's a link available at the end of the presentation. Next, uh, let's take a look at the trends on plastics in the Western Hemisphere, where they tend to be leading global environmental efforts. In the EU, they have banned plastics cutlery, straws, plastics stick on cotton swaps and balloons. Plastic caps on drink bottles are only allowed if they remain attached. There are also efforts to reduce plastics in F&B and also to increase cleanup efforts. The EU is targeting plastic bottles to contain at least 25% of recycled content by 2025 and a 90% collection rate for plastic bottles by 2029. All these efforts are estimated to save the EU 22 billion euros from plastics pollution costs, a key benefit that these circular economy efforts can bring. In the US, there are similar efforts underway, though the regulations differ by states. So what are some of the key elements that support a good plastics recycling ecosystem? We look at some countries which are currently showing a good recycling rate. This includes the EU and leading countries in Asia, such as Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. These countries have set bold targets in terms of their plastics recycling rates. For example, Japan is looking at raising its reuse and recycling rate of plastic containers and packaging to 60%, and for PET bottles, 100%, both by 2030. All these countries have implemented extended producer responsibility, commonly known as EPR, separation at source of the waste, and single-use plastics legislation are in place. Let me next highlight some of the ongoing plastic recycling activities in Singapore in this dashboard. Our current recycling rate is about 4% compared to Malaysia, who is at about 24%, or ASEAN, which is averaging about 12%. Hence, for Singapore, we do have quite a fair bit of opportunity to grow in this area. In Singapore, most of the plastics recycling are via mechanical processing, but there is an ongoing study between Shell and NEA on chemical recycling. In terms of government support, you have heard from Christopher earlier, there's a 3R fund by NEA, and also there are other assistance packages by Enterprise Singapore. Looking at the government regulation, as Christopher has mentioned, Mandatory reporting for packaging is already coming into place to lay the foundation for an EPR for plastics, which will be in place before 2025. In the run-up to that, there are already 50 reverse vending machines, or RVM, on Pilot Island-wide currently. So RVMs are machines which collect and sort anti-plastic drink bottles and give a small tokens to the users after the bottles have been accepted. Moving out from Singapore, Let's take a look at the single-use plastics regulations in the region. You'll see most of the regulations are tar targeted on plastic bags, with countries like Hong Kong and Malaysia levying a charge, while other countries have simply imposed a ban. The other common ban is on straws and cups, as seen in China, Malaysia and Thailand. From the single-use plastics regulations, we next look at the various government roadmaps and reg regulations in the region to spur plastics recycling. In China, the authorities is looking to e-commerce, delivery and fast food companies to reduce packaging and use materials easier for recycling. These companies are also required to report usage of single-use plastics to the Commerce Ministry. In Indonesia, there's a National Plastics Action Partnership to reduce marine plastics pollution to five key steps. Firstly, improving the waste management system. Second, to reduce plastics usage. Third, by redesigning plastics products and packaging. Fourth, by doubling plastics waste collection rates. And finally, through expanding waste disposal facilities. We move to Malaysia, where they also have a comprehensive roadmap to zero waste plastics, which include beginning 2022, to increase usage of bio bags to replace plastic bags and expand the scope of biodegradable and compostable products. This will be further expanded in 2026. And by 2030, the Malaysia Roadmap also includes R&D funding on alternative eco-friendly products and rapid test kit for eco-compliant products. Next, I'd like to introduce you to UOB's Plastics Recycling Ecosystem Financing, which we have deployed across the region. At UOB, we have done quite a bit of research by speaking to various industry experts and players in the region to understand the business flow across 
the plastics recycling ecosystem. This starts from the collectors to the recyclers to the end buyers, who are mainly the large companies in the FMCG, auto or construction industry. I'd like to focus on the main pain points faced across the ecosystem. For the collectors and recyclers, because there exists an informal systems of collections, what we call karanguni in Singapore, there will often be need to pay in cash for the plastics waste collected for recycling. The plastics recyclers are often sandwiched in the middle between the collectors who are usually informally organized and end buyers who are usually large FMCG players. The recycler often need to pay cash upfront for the plastics waste, but the payment from their buyers may only come up to 90 days later. And this results in a working capital squeeze. On the CAPEX side of things, the recycling equipment, including the machine and most, could be a hefty cost which the recyclers will require financing. So based on the pain points we have identified, UOB has put together a comprehensive financing package which covers the working capital needs of the recyclers. This include cash lines as the informal in collectors usually require cash upfront. Within our working capital package, we also offer trade financing, such as early payment discounting, receivable financing, or even customized contract financing based on your long-term supply contracts to the large FMCG buyers. Our equipment financing package is customized with attractive LTV, repayment tenor, and even interest capitalization. To spur the growth of this sector, we have put in place a competitive pricing structure and fast track approval system. If you'd like to hear more about our financing solution, you can email us at sustainable-city at uobgroup.com. Our contact details are also available at the end of the presentation, which is just two slides from here. In addition to our financing solutions for the recycling ecosystem, UOB has developed our in-house green circular economy framework based on the objectives of the UN Sustainable Developmental Goals to cater to the different requirements of the circular economy. This includes material and resource recovery, circular design and inputs, and products as a service or product lifetime extension. Video Iris, an internationally recognized ESG consultant, has provided a second party opinion to endorse our framework. Hence, for recyclers who are engaged in qualifying plastics recycling activities and are interested in our financing, UOB can work with you to provide the green financing accreditation under our framework, which you can publicize on your website or CSR reports. This will be helpful in providing the due recognition for your contributions to the circular economy and profile yourselves accordingly for your buyers who are also looking to ensure that their supply chains support the circular economy efforts. I've come to the end of my presentation. Please visit our UOB Sustainable Financing website which you can find the various green financing solutions we have across different industries to help simplify your sustainability journey. You can also email us at sustainablecity at uobgroup.com or scan the QR code to get in touch with us for further discussions. Thank you for spending the time today with me and thank you SBF for having me. Please continue to stay safe. Thank you very much, Joseph, for giving us a comprehensive overview of the trends and regulations on plastic waste and recycling in the region. And I think, you know, with Singapore's current rate of plastic recycling at 4%, there's definitely much room to grow. And we're happy that, you know, UOB actually has the plastic recycling package to support companies who are keen to embark on this journey. Before we move on to our last speaker, we would like to once again get your thoughts our dear audience watching this from home in our final polling session. Think about what would make you tick and take up sustainable financing. And should you have a project in mind, what is the time frame like for your business? May I have the poll questions launched, please? Again, you will now see a poll with three questions on the screen. Answer all the questions and click on submit. This will serve as a basis for our discussion at the Q&A session later. The poll questions will, will be on your screen for five minutes, so do take your time to answer them. And last, I'm happy to introduce our last speaker, 
Mr. Terence Cole. Terence is the head of technology, media, and telecommunications, what is known as TMT, Sector Solutions Group, UOB. Terence is responsible for the strategic business development activities of the TMT sector within UOB in Asia, and he has led multiple project teams in the negotiations of strategic mergers and acquisition of Singapore companies in the telecommunications, media, and power sectors. Terence will brief us on e-waste, trends, and opportunities. May I invite Terence to our virtual podium, please? Thanks, Sue. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's really a great, great pleasure to be able to be here to share with you the UOB uh, view on with regards to e-waste uh, financing as well as the e-waste trend. This is the agenda that I'll, I'll take you through in this sharing. Um, uh, we will first look at the e-waste trends as well as market updates, as well as looking at the recent uh, implemented EPR framework in Singapore. And lastly, to look at UOB perspective of how we will support the EPR ecosystems uh, in Singapore. Broadly speaking, in terms of defining what are some of the e-waste categories, um, these are six broad cate categories, um, whereby most of them are very much being regulated under the NEA frameworks for e-waste, except for the small equipments that you see in, in number five there. Uh, but in terms of definitions of e-waste category, what we known as waste electrical and electronic equipment, small equipment such as consumer white goods are considered more, uh, part of the e-waste as well. So looking at the, uh, the trends and drivers of e-waste, um, looking at the, the source that we have, um, the latest source that we have is 2019 and based on 2000, 2019, uh, the e-waste generated is about 53.6 million tons. And uh, most of it is coming from, um, as you can see, the small equipment because of the uh, short life cycle of those equipment. But really, if you look at, uh, without that, you look at the large equipment, uh, the air cons, the screens like TVs, or small IT like handphones and lamps, uh, they still made up the majority of it. And right below is on the right, right uh, bottom. So you can see that Asia is the largest generators of EUA, uh, generating about 24, 25 million tons based on 2019. And from the, the 53.6 million tons of EUA generated in 2019, about 17. 0.4% are documented to be collected and properly recycled. And the rest of it, 82.6%, is not really documented. And whether they are being uh, discarded, you know, in a, in a fashion that uh, there isn't any acknowledgement of being, being done sustainably, um, there, is, there is the kind of proportions that we are talking about. And from the e-waste itself, you can see that the potential value of raw materials in the e-waste that is estimated to be of 52, uh, 57 billion US dollars that can be extracted from the raw materials that, is, uh, that can be discovered from the e-waste recycling itself. So what e-waste represents are really opportunities like urban mining of e-waste that will be able to extract and uncover the raw materials that are precious to be recycled for the right purposes. But at the same time, there are also threats regards to the backyard burning practices and illegal um, you know, uh, dealing with the e-waste by uh, dumping into other countries. And uh, those are causing a lot of pollutions to the environment. The EPR framework has been implemented here in Singapore uh, recently, as well as being um, having the licensing of PRO to ALBA. And that provided a lot more uh, regulated framework in terms of practices that leads to e-waste recycling in a more responsible way. And looking at the regions, especially regards to 
regards to the um, countries that's nearer to us, like Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, uh, each of the countries are also in the process of looking at e-waste uh, management and what kind of systems to be implemented for the purpose of uh, managing the e-waste that's being produces, uh, uh, produced within each of their countries and to be able to deal with them responsibly and sustainably. Um, what we're seeing right now is um, based on research that we have done, um, they are in the process, but having said that, they are still behind in terms of the implementations framework relating to creating ecosystems to deal with the e-waste uh, that's being generated within those countries. Malaysians are looking at, uh, similarly, um, in terms of the principles of the EPR approach, similar to what we have done here in Singapore, um, some, and also for Indonesia and Thailand as well. So Singapore is ahead of the, of the curve, but um, what it is is that by understanding how this whole um, e-waste ecosystem is being played out here in Singapore, it does become a good center of excellence with regards to the best practices that can be uh, instituted in each of the countries in our neighbor um, that can look at e-waste management much more sustainably. So under the backdrop of these robust uh, segments drivers, uh, the replacement cycles relating to consumer electronics and appliances markets in Singapore has been the key drivers uh, with regards to uh, e-waste generations here in, here in Singapore. And what it is is also at the same time because of digital transformations, uh, transformations smart appliances, smart equipments are coming into the markets through launch by producers. And hence, that's also spurred a lot more demands with regards to those um, and newer and higher technology uh, smart devices that uh, the consumer is consuming. Um, and we are still seeing the growth in the e-waste productions as and when the consumers start to replace them, as well as enterprises looking at the higher um, uh, tire equipments in terms of higher specs, higher technology driven um, that you need to replace the old equipments and hence also uh, giving rise to new uh, generations of e-waste in the countries. And e-waste recycling in Singapore, as I mentioned, the EPR framework has uh, been implemented. It's what you see in terms of challenges to e-waste recycling in the past. Uh, lack of regulation in that sense um, is, no, is, is being addressed by the EPR frameworks for e-waste uh, that has been implemented. With the licensing of the PRO, um, ALBA, um, the market practices, the best practices will be uh, implemented and uh, with the PRO being the center of the whole ecosystems to provide um, the responsible um, carrying out of the EPR um, uh, business activities that would help to really govern the e-waste uh, recycling um, policies here. At the same time, because of the trends relating to sustainability being uh, an important part of corporate uh, social responsibilities, um, there are corporates uh, like Starhub Renew M1 e-waste drop-off point programs. Various programs are being implemented by corporates here in Singapore to deal with uh, the e-waste uh, re recycling efforts, um, the need to collect them in a responsible manner, transporting them, sorting them out for the purpose of recycling and, and how those are being recycled are, the, are part of the whole value chain within the ecosystem itself. Also at the same time, uh, we are seeing innovations in e-waste recycling. There's, a, there's an app called RESQ, uh, which was launched to connect the local SME to certify e-waste recycling for collections and recycling of e-waste. So what the recyclers will do is that they will pay a monthly subscription, uh, subscription fee to use the platform. And the SME will pay a collection fees if the e-waste weight is below a minimum or uh, as well as a data destruction fee to uh, the recyclers. And um, there are shopping vouchers in the referral uh, for the purpose of um, promoting referrals um, to make use of this platform. So this is in a nutshell, the EPR screen in Singapore, um, ALBA being the PRO, which is um, producer responsibility organizations. 
will basically collect it, will collect a fee um, to govern and carry out the e-waste recycling activities here in Singapore um, based on a fee relating to a percentage of total goods put to markets. Um, those are computations that is under the framework that um, the PRO will provide um, information on with regards to all the stakeholders within these ecosystems. So Alba will, um, as a PRO, will um, look into organizing how collections of e-waste from the public, as well as negotiating terms and distributing the waste to the various approved recyclers. And from here, you can see that uh, this is how the ecosystem played out. And this is our perspective from the UOB um, viewpoint of how we look at the ecosystems centered on PRO being the market operators or what we call the producer responsibility organizations that basically operate the markets relating to the, the best practices uh, that will comply with the frameworks that is uh, put out by NEA. And uh, from the left to right, you see that producers will um, basically to, you know, put to markets their products and consumer once they, are, uh, they have consumed it and to the uh, point of time whereby they will need to dispose them. Um, they will dispose to a collections point, um, uh, very much based on the programs that uh, um, Jakob has actually mentioned in the earliest presentations. And from there, there will be um, a centralization of this uh, within a hub itself, whereby the PRS logistics and sorting hubs will look into uh, sorting and managing of those um, e-waste that's been collected. And from there, allocating and distributing out to the licensed e-waste recyclers. So we look at that, uh, there are various pain points from a bank point of view is that how do we support such an ecosystems regards to each of the stakeholders, uh, knowing that they are working capital funding that is required. From the producers that need to, um, you know, to uh, comply with the obligations to, pro to fund, um, through their memberships with the PRO, as well as the recycling fees based on the, uh, the amount for electronic goods that is being put to markets. And for the licensed e-waste recyclers, there will be a need to invest in plants um, or recycling the, uh, manufacturing, uh, recycling processes and factories, um, as well as to invest in new equipment to be able to recycle them in, in a responsible and sustainable weight. And most of these are very much guided by the PRO being the, um, the, the best practice frameworks providers and they will provide that guidance to the recyclers in terms of how to deal with them. And it is exactly this kind of working capital as well as KPEX funding that we think uh, UOB will be a good enablers to provide that support to the players here within the ecosystems. So this is the full sweep of what we call green financing for circular economy relating to e-waste e e itself. Uh, we do have what we call receivable financing solutions that relates to um, in recyclers that have receivables or basically invoicing the PRO relating to um, the recycling services that they have extended under the, under the uh, EPR framework here in Singapore itself. So the receivable is actually on the PRO, which is uh, a very much a licensed entity and regulated by NEA. So hence the way we look at it is that there, there is a lot of comfort that we have from there that we will be able to offer to the recyclers. Once you have the commercial contracts and being licensed or uh, being put to uh, as the approved uh, panel of service provider for recycling, then you'll find that uh, we as UOB itself will be able to provide uh, the receivable financing kind of solutions, knowing that there are creditors behind that um, to support your working capital funding. At the same time, transaction banking services, capital support, as I mentioned, um, as, as I understand from the market survey, um, the current facility onshore in Singapore is still with regards to recycling of all the various components, and some of them are fairly specialized in terms of equipment. Um, we do not have sufficient capacity at this point of time. So with the implementations of the EPR framework for e-waste, 
as well as the PRO role uh, within the ecosystem itself. We do foresee that there's going to be new investments coming in. There's going to be CAPEX uh, funding growth uh, requirements um, that we will be very interested to support the key stakeholders in these whole ecosystems as a way of how you will be enabled um, in the circular economy. Um, at the same time, um, uh, knowing that there will be certain kind of treasury solutions that might be required regards to the stakeholders in terms of their, fund, their funding versus their business operations. Uh, as a bank itself, we are putting them all together to be able to support you in a more holistic manner. Yeah, this is my last slide. So it's, a, it's a same slide as what Joseph has actually gone through. Uh, we do have websites that give us, uh, that give you more information related to sustainable financings that UOB offers. But at the same time, to, to share with you that uh, UOB, uh, we look to simplify sustainability for business and knowing that we are able to be your ecosystem partner in, in the form of enabling you to provide the kind of funding required by the business to carry out your growth and activities to um, establish the whole use ecosystems in, in a manner that is sustainable and, uh, and, and strong. And that's where we are seeing ourselves from UOB point of view to support um, the markets where we are operating in. So besides Singapore itself, um, we have the same kind of solutions for the region, depending on how the regulations are over there. We do look at commercial contracts relating to enterprises to enterprises on the take back programs by enterprises whereby they enter into an IT asset disposal commercial contracts uh, with service provider and how those are being disposed, how data are being um, uh, erased from those IT equipments all the way down to recyclings. Those are um, encapsulates within the bundle of solutions that we do have. So I, I hope I have um, given you a, a good overview of how you will be uh, look at e-waste uh, financings or recycling uh, financings uh, bundle. And uh, if you need uh, any kind of information, um, you know, I, I, I can be contacted for that or I will be, look forward to the Q&A sections after this. Thanks a lot. Uh, can I pass this back to Sue then? Thank you very much, Terence. Um, and, and you know, with Singapore being the second largest producer of the e-waste per capita in Asia, as mentioned on one of your slides just now, we're certainly glad to know that there are room for businesses in e-waste recycling and that UOB has the financing support uh, for this ecosystem. Before we move on to our Q&A session, I'd like to share the results from our third poll that was concluded just now. May I have the results from the third polling session, please? So Joseph, coming from a bank, what are your thoughts on the results of a question one? What is the most important consideration for you in deciding to adopt sustainable financing? Okay. Um, I think most of us would agree that in the last 18 months or so, you know, we can see there's been a surge in uh, awareness on ESG and uh, more companies are adopting uh, sustainable practices. So uh, it's good to see that, you know, for most of the respondents, uh, you know, they're trying to do their part in uh, saving the environment. Okay. But uh, the part about potential cost savings actually uh, doesn't come, by, come as a surprise to me. Yeah. Uh, this actually is the most uh, common question I get asked on uh, sustainable financing. Um, for su sustainability link financing, which is usually linked to an ESG rating, you know, just like uh, just like very large companies have credit ratings, or some sort of uh, sustainable performance target, there are usually some pricing incentives or pen even penalties, depending on what the companies can achieve. So the incentives are there to encourage the companies to do better. But uh, based on the you know, companies I've come across that uh, partake in this type of sustainability financing, usually uh, the pricing discount or even the penalty for falling short is not their main consideration, I would say. Um, I think a lot of companies now uh, do have uh, mandated sustainability uh, reporting 
uh, required, you know, in SGX, Versa, Malaysia, or Thaiset, all these have been mandated. And uh, I also just come across a report released this week uh, from the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance. So sustainable investments now total 35 trillion, or more than a third of all assets in, the, in five of the world's uh, top uh, financial markets. So various studies have shown that you know, companies that have strong ESG practices tend to outperform in the stock market and also deemed to be lower ESG risk. So a lot of these also are driven by market forces, you know, prompting companies to step up their sustainability initiatives. Yeah. And uh, Shu, if you don't mind, can I also uh, comment on the earlier poll? Uh, yes, please. That, that, uh, on, on, on the feedback regarding sustainability financing. I, I think uh, if I recur, refer to the screenshot that I took, you know, quite a lot uh, undecided because they do not understand what sustainability financing is. You know, they think there's uh, extra costs upfront in, adopt in adopting some of these uh, practices. So I think uh, Terence uh, earlier touched on, you know, some, on some of the green financing frameworks uh, that UOB has. So we, at UOB recognize that you know, green and sustainability financing is something that has taken off uh, in recent times and uh, integrating sustainability into business strategies can be complex. So we do have uh, financing frameworks uh, across different industries you know, uh, looking at real estate, I think that might have been covered earlier, looking at solar and smart cities to help simplify this uh, complex process, you know, and provide a clear method to assess eligible green activities and what are the criteria involved so that, you know, uh, all these uh, efforts can be recognized and also avoid any concerns about greenwashing. Uh, so we hope to make it simpler and faster for our clients to assess sustainable financing. And on the question uh, regarding cost, it's good that we are all in Singapore uh, because uh, the Singapore government, you know, under the what we call MSG SLS uh, scheme, does have quite a lot of uh, support uh, for companies trying to assess uh, green or sustainable financing. So for companies that are interested to embark on this sustainable journey, uh, as far as financing is concerned, uh, please reach out to us. UOB will be glad to you know to provide more insights into how this can be done. Thank you, Joseph. And ladies and gentlemen, it's time for our Q&A session. So if you have any questions at any point of time, even now at this moment, you can type your questions using the Q&A uh, function that is located at the bottom. Can I get all the panelists to turn on their video, please? Thank you so much. So we do have um, quite a number of questions and uh, I'll just like to start off uh, with uh, addressing some questions to Christopher from NEA. One of the question is, you know, would there be any policies to reduce or ban single use plastic uh, to reduce waste in the upstream consumption? And a related question to that is, you know, what is your take on biodegradable packaging? and any sort of deve developments that's already taking place uh, in this space. So Christopher, please. Hi, thanks very much, Shu, and to, for the questions. I also want to thank the fellow panelists for the very insightful presentations. I, I would like to address this question by first, uh, just saying that, okay, um, I know that many people think that plastics is sort of the, the most evil material but uh, in reality, actually every sort of material has, has a life cycle impact. Right? So, you know, plastics um, emit carbon uh, when they're burnt. So, okay, that there's a problem with that, but carbon is also emitted throughout the whole production life cycle right, of any product. In addition, when it comes to other sorts of um, material used for packaging, such as paper, um, even plastic alternatives such as PLA, right, which is a sort of a form of bioplastics, um, that there are problems because there is potential land use change created by the conversion of forest to plantation for the purpose of providing the feedstock. So there is a life cycle impact um, to all sorts of materials, uh, be it plastic, be it paper, 
bioplastics, um, so on and so forth. And I mean, there, there is, um, there is an NEA, uh, there, there are some materials on this that I think I'll be quite happy to share after this seminar and I can sh share them through SPF. So I just want to emphasize that, right? That, so with that in mind, um, would there be policies to uh, reduce or ban single-use plastic? I, I think the issue is not really banning or reducing single-use plastic, but rather trying to address the wider issue of disposable packaging <laughs> in upstream consumption. So that is the bigger issue. And uh, so there was a citizens work group on reducing disposables, which ran sometime from the middle of last year to the start of this year. So that citizens work group came up with uh, a few recommendations. Uh, amongst them, there, there were things like checklists uh, for F&B um, outlets to reduce uh, the use of disposables. And one of them was actually to start public consultations for disposable carrier bag charge. Please note again, it is not the disposable plastic bag charge, but the disposable carrier bag charge, okay? So we, we are looking at um, trying to do this and public consultations uh, are ongoing right now. Uh, so that is, uh, I hope that helps answer the question on uh, the plastic, the reduce and ban of single-use of single -use plastic as well as that of biodegradable packaging. I must also add, that actually um, materials such as oxo-degradable plastics or plastic alternatives are considered contaminants in the plastics recycling process, right? So for instance, uh, if we have an uh, oxo-degradable bag, right, which is, this, which is somehow given to a plastics recycler, uh, be it mechanical recycling or chemical recycling, as, my, as Mr. Poe from OUB had pointed out earlier, those are actually considered contaminants and it doesn't help the recycling process. Then what is the alternative? The alternative in Singapore, at least, is disposal through incineration. And um, so actually, it all gets turned to ash and there's, there isn't that much of a difference um, to the type of, to, um, to the disposal process in Singapore. I mean, part of it is because we have quite a good collection system in Singapore where all waste is collected, swept from the streets. So we, we don't have the issue of, um, of say uh, leftover plastics left by the roadside as much as other countries. Thank you. Thank you so much for your replies, Christopher. And if I can move on to Jakob, um, there are also some questions uh, addressed to you uh, coming from Elba. So one of the questions is, you know, uh, you know, people are interested to know where do the recycle the recovered materials uh, that. Uh, from the e-waste recyclers, where do they go? You know, are they sold here locally or exported overseas? And the related question to that, uh, Jakob, is that, you know, we all know that segregation is a big problem in Singapore. And a lot of uh, plastic bins here, you know, under our HDBs are actually dumped with uh, plastic, food waste, and other sort of waste. So, you know, when, when you are recovering your waste uh, in, in Jurong, how does Elba deal with this? And um, it can be a, actually a very costly process if it's done by waste collection service companies. Thank you, thank you, Shu, and um, thanks for the excellent questions. Uh, to the first question about e-waste, that's I think a very, very important and very good question um, because of course the recycling process does not end with the electronic waste recyclers who are doing the preliminary dismantling um, for example, from a refrigerator, taking out the refrigerant gases and making sure these are treated properly, but then separating also the metals, the precious metals, and the different types of plastics that are generated in e-waste. Uh, can be PS, can be ABS, and so on. Um, that's, however, of course, not the end of the value chain. To really fully close the circular loop, um, these materials then have to be brought to downstream recyclers. And that's exactly something that we will be looking at in a second step uh, of this scheme. Um, so for now, um, bear with us. Uh, we only started a couple of weeks ago and, and we're still looking to improve and set up the landscape of electronic waste recyclers. But we are also engaging now in talks with downstream recyclers, not just outside of Singapore, because currently a lot is still being exported, um, but also within Singapore to see how certain types of plastics um, uh, also precious metals, but specifically plastics can be further treated within Singapore. So that's for us a very important topic um, that we look to tackle in the next uh, years, I would say. Um, so, so very good question to, to really bring that, that circular economy uh, approach uh, forward. Then the second question, segregation is definitely a topic. 
Um, and it's something that, as, as you saw in our presentation, we're working on, right? So for example, we are, um, we have, we have, we're collaborating on the shoe waste collection. Um, NEA is, of course, also working on a lot of regulation that will bring further segregation at source into play, such as, for example, the deposit return scheme for beverage containers, such as, as Christopher mentioned, the um, separate food waste collection. So all these kind of things will come. And in the end, it's all about education. Um, yes, there is still contamination in waste. And yes, uh, for example, food waste contamination does have a negative effect on the recycling process and can in fact lead to certain material that should be able to be recycled to have to go to incineration. But that's about education. And, and we believe that over time that will significantly improve in Singapore. Um, and, uh, and then these things can, can be properly recycled. And as I mentioned before as well, we are certainly co also collecting data, um, not just from the source, but also from the MRF, from the recycling plant, from the sorting plant, um, to see how high the impurities are, um, to see where, in which areas they are better or worse, where we need to target education and so on. Um, so that also runs through data collection and, uh, and analyzing this data to improve such a system. So I'm very positive uh, about this development in Singapore. I can tell you in Germany, we have six or seven bins at home uh, for all the different types of material and only a very small fraction of waste lands in the, what is here called refuse bin uh, because we have um, plastics recycling bin, glass, even in different colors, um, uh, packaging waste, so plastic, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, carton and paper waste and so on, all in separate bins, bio waste, and so it's certainly possible, and, and I'm very positive uh, about what will come in Singapore with all the new initiatives. Thank you so much, Jakob. And uh, if I can turn to Joseph uh, from UOB, you know, if let's say we have an SME who is interested in a plastic uh, financing package, uh, who wants to do plastic uh, recycling a project overseas, you know, would UOB have um, support for such an initiative? Sure, uh, sure thanks for that question. Uh, definitely we do. Uh, I think UOB, we have a very strong footprint in the ASEAN region, uh, in Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and all the way up to uh, greater China. So I think uh, besides Singapore, we are fairly active in the plastics recycling space in Malaysia. So we have financed a few companies over there. So our colleagues in Malaysia will be more than happy to support in this area. And also, you know, we have also gone as far as uh, Japan to support uh, one of our customers there that set up a plastics recycling plant. So uh, we are definitely keen to support Singapore companies that expand overseas in this area. Thank you, Joseph. And one quick question for you, Terence. I think uh, one of your slides uh, at, towards the end, you mentioned um, that there's some sort of a green trade uh, finance uh, on re regarding the, uh, the e-ways um, financing package that UOB is, uh, is offering. So could you please uh, elaborate uh, what does it entail? Yeah, uh, thanks so for the questions. Um, green trade finance relates to trade financing of uh, green related activities. So broadly speaking, uh, there are two perspectives that we take uh, with regards to what is deemed as green activities. One is relating to a pure play. That is uh, when, we, when we talk about um, when we talk about the companies that's really in uh, the whole circular economy itself, uh, take for example, like Alba, um, it is already a licensed PRO within the e-waste um, ecosystems, so to speak. And because of its status as a, as a PRO licensed by NEA, um, the commercial dealing relating to trade activities between the, between the suppliers to Alba, as well as the Alba customers, or maybe with regards to um, its producer memberships, uh, in those commercial dealings. Those are what we call uh, green activities because of Alba um, performing its core activities as a PRO within the license framework. So uh, when we talk about uh, financing, those trade activities, be it the su supplier financing or the receivable discounting, those can be deemed as green trade finance. And from that framework itself, because we are promoting uh, this in, in a way of enabling sustainability, sustainability, uh, sustainability with regards to uh, Singapore, we will be looking at a fast approval, also looking at pricing in a way of those debt or financings to the companies in enhancing their ability to grow 
in the area. This is why I call pure play. The other one is what we I call maybe you are a supplier that is supplying all kind of equipments relating to telecommunications. And one of your equipments or your, your projects is a supplier of equipments to a green data center here in Singapore. There is already gotten a green mark from IMDA BCA, uh, green mark data centers uh, awards, um, pertinence awards. Then you'll find that we will try to structure that for the purpose of their sales of equipment to that green data centers to be uh, denoted or to be defined as a green uh, financing. And if it's relating to supplier financing, we'll call that green trade finance too. So these are the two perspectives we look at that. One is a pure, pure play. The other one is basically you know, um, a buyer or a supplier relating to uh, connected green activities. There has a certain pure play in the, uh, in the counterparty of the trade dealings itself. So that, that's, uh, that's how we look at it at this point of time. Thank you so much, Terence. And on behalf of SBF, we would like to thank Christopher, Jakob, Joseph, and Terence for joining us today and addressing this very important topic on circular economy financing. Next up on our calendar, we'll be organizing the fourth episode of the UOB Sustainable Financing Awareness Series Financing for Energy Efficiency on 26th of August at 3 p.m. Do join us as we explore opportunities created in, in this sector. And you're definitely not alone in your sustainability journey. The SPF and UOB will be here. And please sign up for our business clinic um, after the session if you're interested. And just email my colleague Zichuan to register your interest. If you want to find out more about SPF infrastructure community and the work that we do with, Please use your mobile phone to scan the first QR code. And the second QR code will actually um, lead you to our registration page to join our infrastructure interest group mailing list. Do, do sign up if you are interested, uh, and SPF will keep you updated regularly on some of the events and projects that we have. And lastly, we would appreciate if you can take some time to fill out a short survey form administered by a third party, Fox Research, pertaining to this webinar by scanning the QR code on the screen with your mobile phone. It will only take you less than five minutes. And once again, my name is Shu Lin from SBF and I'm pleased to be your host today. Thank you for staying with us over the last one and a half hours. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you again. <laughs>